Hey, I want to talk to you a little bit about evolution. Um, uh, evolution is being taught all over the world. Actually, uh, what most people don't realize is that um, uh, some years ago, probably sort of 15 years ago, through the knowledge of DNA, uh, scientists found out some uh, alarming uh, information. And they found out through the knowledge of DNA that in fact nothing evolved. Um, it's called intelligent design. And these scientists are increasingly become greater in number as the years go on. And of course, uh, any scientists are looking at the DNA in such, um, with such greater understanding now that they're seeing the evidence of a designer, a, a creator. Of, uh, in other words, like a cat was always a cat, a dog was always a dog, a monkey was always a monkey, and a human being was always a human being. Uh, also through DNA is that, uh, you know, you can trace your ancestry back, and um, that uh, actually they've traced the ancestry back of the entirely, the scientists have gone, they've traced the human ancestry back right the way back. Uh, that's that they've, they've gone to all different parts of the world, all different colours of the, the different um, skin colours, and they've traced that they've all got a common uh, ancestor. They can trace everyone back to one woman. And in fact, they've, they've called her Eve, because in Hebrew, he, uh, Eve means mother of all living. Um, now, of course, uh, you know, we, where you think to yourself, well, why aren't we being taught all this in schools? Why aren't the schools teaching our children evil, uh, intelligent design? I mean, surely if it's the most up-to-date scientific evidence, um, then of course, why? Well, the, I mean, surely the schools will be teaching the most up-to-date scientific evidence. But what you find is that you find that actually the government um, uh, are, uh, are intent on making sure that people believe evolution. They've been intent on on, on uh, making sure people believe in evolution. They they uh, the first thing they do obviously is is they teach the children in school, and um, and as we grow up we don't doubt it. We think well evolution must be a fact. We read the Bible and we find out that um, that God created Adam and Eve, and we find out that um, that uh, that uh, that you know we, it doesn't sit uh, death did not come until after the sin of man, and um, and of course that flies right in the face of the whole theory of evolution. So uh, many people they think to themselves, well, evolution obviously is the facts, and the Bible's just all made up. When of course uh, it's not, it's not made up at all is that there are spiritual powers and forces of evil and wicked uh, from wicked places that are doing their best to um, to prevent people from the obvious, really, and that's to believe in a creator God. Well, as I say, modern science now is coming to that, comes to that final conclusion that, in fact, everything is intelligent design. But I just want to talk to you a little bit about evolution, and, uh, and I want you to sort of consider some of the things I'm saying, and if you look back into the history and you perhaps Google a few of the things I'm interested, I'm talking about right now, um, I mean, the film about DNA is called Unlocking the Mystery of Life. You get the DVD or the documentary or, you know, you can, I think you can find it on YouTube. Um, but it's well worth buying. It's well worth getting into your schools, into your headmaster. You know, I'll be honest, I don't think, it's, uh, I don't think they're going to take too much notice of it uh, because the government will sack anyone that teaches intelligent design. They are not allowed to teach intelligent design in schools. They have to teach evolution. Now, let me just talk about evolution for a moment. Uh, evolution, uh, if you go back, say, four or 500 years, if for those that are uh, real academics, you'll be able to get the exact name of the person. You'll be able to get the um, all the details. Uh, you'll be able to get the exact exact year. Um, but approximately four to 500 years ago, there was uh, a scientist that, um, that had the theory of evolution. Now, he was very unpopular, of course, because people believed in the biblical account of creation um, he was very unpopular but nevertheless he had this theory and his theory began believing that there was originally one huge planet and from that one very very huge planet that was absolutely massive spontaneously exploded there was no god no creator just what just spontaneously exploded didn't know why it exploded just spontaneously exploded and of course from that explosion come all the planets and eventually us on planet earth and of course uh, you know over millions of or even billions of years eventually here i am talking to you and here's the you know there's you are listening to me that's the theory of evolution. Um, now, the thing is, is that that, that, that chap, the theory um, was caught on by the scientists, but scientists would come along and go, no, 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 that, uh, that planet was much smaller than that. It wasn't as big as that. So they'd make out that same theory, um, but they're just the planet would be much smaller. Well, I believe that by the time I was born, I'm, I'm nearly 60 years old, by the time I was, I was born, um, 1958 I was born, um, I believe that that by that time, that planet, other scientists had come along and that planet had got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually 
they were saying that every single thing in the every every incidentally they've found billions more stars over, uh, through through the through the hubble telescope and other telescopes as well billions more stars more galaxies you know let's be honest it goes on for eternity it's, it's, it's infinity out there they have got no idea what's out there for all, all they know all what they know of is just you know you could fit into that little area just there and and everything is everything's so much bigger than what they actually think but the billions and billions of stars the earth the moon everything that every every bit with everything with carbon and matter within it they said was no bigger when it was squashed down to a pencil a pencil dot at the end of your sentence that's how small that planet got now incredibly there were some really intelligent people that believed that and of course they continue then to write their books and write their theses and and uh, and to speak in the in the universities and in the in the great colleges and of course the teaching comes down right the way through to the school children in our schools they get taught they come from monkeys they get taught that they evolved and um but what you got to ask a question this is interesting children if anyone's listening to this and they and they would like to just um you know have a, an interesting conversation with a teacher or, a, or a, a scientist or a philosopher somebody that um that believes in evolution you say to them well where did, where did we come from then and they're going to say well we come from monkeys you say well, where did the monkeys come from you say well they're going to come from a smaller mammal you say well where did the smaller mammal come from well an even smaller mammal well where did that come from and then they're going to say well it come from originally it originally come out the sea so it was originally a sea creature you, we were originally sea creatures that uh, one of the one of the little sea creatures they grew legs and and uh, and come out and uh, they their lungs adapted to the to breathe air and they become mammals and you say well where did that little sea creature come from and they say well a smaller sea creature and then you say where did that sea creature come from and eventually they go back to this single cell that spontaneously come to life no reason for it just just come to life and uh, and of course that eventually become you and i sitting here listening and talking about this then you say to them but where did that single cell come from and they'll say well the rain built up beat, beat down onto the rocks for millions and millions or some say billions of years and out of the, out the rocks and the sediment of course in the rocks come chemicals and that's where your chemicals come from for the single cell that spontaneously come to life so you say well, where did the rocks come from where did the rocks and where did the rain come from and they say ah oh, well there was a big bang you see and then they talk about the big bang and then they eventually come down to this dot and you're expected to believe that i mean i say i, I understand stupid up mister if you had to crush every little piece of every piece of steel down from my gym just my gym and crush it down to no more than a dot on the end of your page you would need real faith to believe that 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 was even possible now you got not got just to have the steel in the gym you've got to have all the steel in the entire world all the cars all every, every bit of metal you can think of think of it for a minute and imagine it squashed down to nothing more than a dot you believe that that's what they want you to believe this is that this is what evolution used to teach and now now they teach something even more but many evolutionists now teach that actually nothing existed it all come out of nothing this is what they teach there was nothing and it all came out of nothing nothing spontaneously exploded <laughs> and and out of this nothing spontaneous. But anyway let's just go back to the dot because i find the dot very interesting so you can imagine now because remember of course that this dot business was taught to our to our um our well to our parents to to to, to, to their grandfather to, to so now we got back to this dot they want us to believe that all the steel all the cars it all bought down this little tiny little dot no, 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 no. Now you got to have the whole Earth, everything, and the the whole Earth. I mean, the Earth is a big place. If you've, if you've ever been out on an aeroplane, I've flown to very different parts of the world. It's a big place, right? You got to squash the whole Earth down to nothing more than that dot. No, 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 no. Not just that though. You got to take the Moon in with it. The Moon. You know, we look up the Moon. There it is. Got to squash that down as well. Now you got to take the Sun. You got to squash the sun, which is magnificently huge. All right, if you're if you're technical and you know the technical dimensions of this and ever, you'll be sitting there going, "Wow, yeah, this guy doesn't really know how big things are, but yet he is is on the button." Do you know what I mean? You got to squash the sun down, and you got to squash the moon down, squash the earth down, and get it in that dot at the end of your page, that pencil dot. Now you're not just that, not just that. You've got to have the billions of stars. And the galaxies and 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 the, and the stuff that they know about right now squashed down no more than just that dot 
That's what they taught. That's what they taught evolution. Now, listen to me. You've got to have such faith in that. You know, to me, it's pretty obvious. It's pretty obvious. I've just, I've just got a Bible with me, Holy Bible. Incidentally, I'm a born-again Christian. Jesus saved me, what, 25 years ago, April 1990. I was injured in the gym. I couldn't move my right, left arm without pain. And I got desperate. I got desperate enough to cry out to Jesus. And I asked him, begged him to forgive all my sin. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. God came into my life and he saved me. And I said, Lord, heal my shoulder so I can do the things you know I want to do. And he healed me. I woke up in the morning completely healed. You know, uh, the Jesus came into my life and saved me. Now, I just want to say, this book... It, I, do I have to prove to you that this book was made by somebody? For me to prove the obvious, this book was made by somebody, do I need to go and get the person that put it together and, you know, printed it, the factory, the factory owner? Do I need to get him? Do I need to go and get the factory owner to prove to you that this book was made by somebody? No, of course not. You use common sense. You look at the book. There's the evidence. The book exists. There it is. Clearly, it was designed by somebody. Do you know how much more complex you and I are than that book? It's the, I mean, the book is the word of the living God. Most valuable thing on the face of the planet. You know, tells you about Christ and salvation and how to, how to get to heaven and how to, how to escape the f eternal fires of hell. Jesus come to save us. The devil wants everyone to believe in evolution. Because if you believe in evolution, you'll throw this book away. But now think about what I've said. A little child is saying to his teacher, where did this come from? Where did that come from? Where did this come from? The teacher goes right the way back to the Big Bang. And he says to her, after she's explained about eventually everything being squashed down into nothing more than just a little dot. So he says to her, teacher, when did you first hear that? She says, when I was a child. <laughs> he says, listen, the boy says to the teacher, he says, listen, children will believe in anything. Thanks for listening. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give me words to speak. Lord God, I pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you would have me say and speak anything you want me to say right now. I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Stan's Gym. I'm Stan. I've been here 35 years. I've only been a Christian 25 years. When I was 18 years old, I, there was a tragic motorcycle accident in Upminster. I say tragic because... There was a little group of us, or a little gang of us motorcyclists, and we all, all were just getting big bikes and racing and tearing around and having fun, just like lads do. But uh, unfortunately, um, we were in Upminster, and we were—I was pulling away from the, the fish and chip shop, or the, the Chinese rather. My pals were pulling away from the fish and chip shop a bit further up the road, and as I pulled away and I went to turn right down the approach, my pals were overtaking me, doing 90 miles per hour on their motorcycle. And uh, my best pal was on the back, a guy called Andrew Goff, and, uh, and a good friend of mine was was riding a bike, a guy called Richard Burton. But they hit me in the side broadside, and as they hit me in the in the side broadside at 90 miles per hour, as I turned right down the approach, what I experienced was two realities. If you'd have been there and seen this tragedy, other motorcyclists were there, my pals, a lot of people actually saw this take place. If you'd have seen it take place, you'd have seen my body and my pal's bodies all go flying down the road i was it like a snooker like a snooker ball it right down the road and we laid down the road as dead men but what i experienced was at the point of impact drawn directly down as if drawn by gravity to the road below me my feet touched the ground and i fell into a position with one leg back one leg bent under me and my hands stretched forward my fingertips touching the ground from that position i got straight up and i walked three or four paces and i sat down by the side of the road on like the pavement area leaning up against a tree or sitting by a tree and i watched the bike burn and i was no i was totally unaware that in fact that i would i'd physically died i was totally unaware of it as i sit there in this place experiencing this amazingly heavenly feeling and being unaware that in fact i died i saw a dark cloud come down above me a cloud that filled the sky and it caused me to look up because it drew my attention and as i looked up i heard almighty god speak to me out the dark cloud and god's voice was masculine and spoke to me but gently and poignantly just to me 
but I, because his voice filled the sky, I immediately knew it was Almighty God. And from what he said to me, immediately I realised my predicament. And I started to, I screamed because I wanted to live. And as I started to scream, God put me back inside my physical body in the twinkling of an eye and I was back looking at the ambulance lights going round. And I was all busted up. I was taken to hospital, all busted up. But nevertheless, thankfully, I recovered. Now you'd have thought to yourself that after an experience like this, with God speaking to me, experiencing the afterlife, realizing that I had a spirit. And even though my physical body at that time was dead, I was still very much alive, very much able to experience love, to experience kindness, to experience, to hear, very able to walk, very, but also could experience fear. You'd think to yourself that I would have picked the Bible up and I'd have started reading the Bible and, and perhaps even become, you know, become a Christian at that point in my life. But no, I, I recovered, got out of hospital, and I just carried on with my life. And even though I always knew that God was real, double real, I believed in God beforehand, before the accident. But now I had this experience, I knew that God was double real. But I just carried on living my life. And I, that's part of the reason why I went with, through the injuries. I started getting involved in weights. So that I would... Uh, strengthen my body so that I would um, you know get strong get powerful and once I began to realize in those early days about what could be achieved through training and how strong you could get you know a, a man can get two three times as strong than what he was when he first starts out and how he can put pack muscle onto his body change the way he looks that's why I become a competitive bodybuilder and I also become a competitive powerlifter in a, in a smaller way but here at the club but the reason why I got involved in the training was because of this injury and I wanted to strengthen myself. But I got all wrapped up in my own life and just living my own way. And even though I believed in God, I know when I had opportunity to to uh, to, to perhaps pray to God and, and to, to perhaps ask him to forgive all my sins and to give up my life to the Lord for me to get right with God through faith in Christ, I'd always reject it. I was never ready. I always imagined, well, on my deathbed, when I'm about to croak, you know, oh, Jesus, please forgive all my sin. Give my life to the Lord then. So I, nobody wants to go to hell. And I and I knew that hell was real. I knew hell was real deep down, even though I used to say, oh, there's no hell. But that's because it made me feel better. I, I felt better saying, oh, I don't believe in hell. But deep, deep down, I knew that there was a hell. I knew that there was a heaven. And I knew that Jesus was the only way there. God had revealed those things to me. And I can thank God for that. So I ended up getting injured in the gym because a competitive bodybuilder. I was always interested in powerlifting. I was always pushing my body to the extreme. But one of my main things that I did wrong in all those training years is I overtrained. I trained the body part too many times per week. I learned over the years now is that the, 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 even though we've got a world champion, Mike Joseph, come out of Stan's gym. He's an undefeated world record holder for flat bench press. Bench pressing, I think he weighed 82 kilogram and he bench pressed 200 kilogram training here at Stan's gym over a period of many years, training and slowly getting his weights up, but he's undefeated, world record holder. And he only used to train chest and body, each body part once a week. Well, back in the day when I was training, because I run my own club and it just seemed that loads of people train each body part twice a week. Some people even train each body part three times a week. Your body can't recover from it and therefore it causes injuries. And this is what happened to me through overtraining. It wasn't the fact that I was in the gym too many times, it was the fact I was training each body part too many times per week. That's where the problem lay. Anyway, so I ended up with an injured left shoulder joint and, uh, and, and a tendon or whatever it was, and I'm not sure what it was. The fact was, is the fact that it never got any better. And even though a couple of two or three years went by of me not being able to train, so I stopped competing, I stopped I stopped training. Because I, I, I just it just hurt me just to move my arm. So I got to a stage in desperation well, I was thinking about surgery. April 1990, I lay in bed thinking about surgery. And, uh, and, and I was, I, I was, I'll be honest with you, I've always been an optimist. I was always very optimistic in my life. But all of a sudden now, I, I, I'd really got to the end of the line and I thought, oh, I want to see a specialist. I want to get my shoulder operated on, get it fixed, borrow money if need be, 
get the shoulder fixed, and then I could get back training properly again, which is what I really, really missed in my life. I knew that that was a good thing in my life. I wanted to get back training. And as I lay in my bed, April 1990, Sunday morning, about two, three o'clock in the morning, I was living here at the gym at the time, at the back, just living at the back. And um, I was laying there and I thought to myself, God, it's going to take months to see a specialist. Well, God, he must know all about me because he created me. And with that, I sort of saw the light. You've heard that when people say, it? I see the light. Well, you only see the light when you come to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that's why I saw the light. And I cried out to Jesus, Lord Jesus, forgive all my sin. I cried out to him. I give my life to you, I said to him. Forgive me. I give my life to you. And with my heart, I, I had a repentant heart. I didn't use the word repentance, but I just had a repentant heart. I wanted God in my life. I wanted to give my life to God. I'd had enough. And I then prayed, Lord Jesus, please heal my shoulder so I can do the things you know I want to do. I didn't know what that was at the time, but God see my heart. And God saw that what I wanted to do was the will of God. And that's exactly what's going on today. But I woke up in the morning. In that very morning, I woke up completely healed. You know, people have said to me, people have said, well, with all the different religions in the world, Stan, how do you know that you got the right one? How do you know that you really are in the right religion? Christianity, how do you know that? And I try and explain to them, listen, I died when I was 18 years old. God spoke to me out of a cloud. He gave me these revelations. I knew that Jesus died for my sin and rose again. I knew it. And when I come to the Lord in the way that God had laid out in the scriptures, he was there for me. And yes, he came into my life and filled me with his spirit and made me all brand new. Hallelujah. He healed me. He healed me physically. He healed me spiritually and he made me one with himself. And that's, you know, so it's like, hello, you know, God's in my life. That's the reason why I know this is the right way for you to follow. Jesus himself said, speaking about himself, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the father except through me. It means no one comes to heaven except through Jesus Christ. Why is that? Why is there only one way to heaven? Because God became flesh. And come and lived a sinless life, born of a virgin, so there was no sin, sinful nature in Jesus. Because he didn't have a human father. He came from heaven. The virgin birth was, was miraculous. He lived a sinless life. And in living a sinless life, he performed many miracles. Once, once he was 30 years old and he, and he, and he, he, he was baptised in the Holy Spirit. And he, he, he went forth for his, his ministry for around about three years. Then it, that led to his death and his resurrection. His glorious resurrection. But during that time, there's many miracles, healings, uh, that, all types of miraculous things where people were being helped and God was showing his power through Christ. This is incredible. This is absolutely amazing because when you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, you start to live in a miraculous life. You start to see the miracles of God in your life from day to day. It's truly amazing how God answers prayer. I've had other miracles. I've had Jesus heal my knees. Now, the thing is, there's some miracles you get immediately, some miracles you get when God wants to give them to you. For some reason, I don't understand it. I don't understand God entirely. All our, God's ways and my ways, what I would do and what God does, sometimes will differ. It's because what I would do is one thing. What God does is something different. But nevertheless, I know that through my prayer relationship with God, God does miracles. There's nothing he can't do in your life. There's nothing he can't do in my life if you trust him. And you keep and you keep trusting him first you've got to come to him begin to pray there's a little child you had to learn to walk we've got me and my wife we've got a baby and she's just learning to walk work walks a few steps and falls over you know you've got to learn to pray pray to jesus the one mediator between god the father and us the only mediator there is no other there's no other there's no other religion that leads to god there's only christ and jesus is not a religion jesus is a person he is god in flesh so when people go, oh, Stan, you've got all religious on us. No, I haven't. I'm talking about a relationship that I've got with God that you can have too. Anyway, so Jesus, Jesus healed me. I woke up in the morning completely healed. Wow. And also I'd become a Christian. So that was just like, phew, nobody expected that in my life. You know, no one expected me, Stan Earl, to become a Christian. To be honest, no one. Everyone was very shocked. But me, I'd got God in my life. And now God was beginning to show me it, uh, it, not only his love but to show me how he feels about other people about the fact that god loves everybody the god oh, people go what well, does god love pedophiles 
Does it mean to say that if a paedophile turns the Lord, he can get saved? The thing is, that, listen here. The Bible says that God hardens who he wants to harden and softens who he wants to soften. In the book of Romans, when it speaks about Pharaoh, I mean, you, you've heard the, the Ten Commandments. You've heard about when, when Pharaoh drowned, or, or rather, right, where the God drowned all the Egyptians in the, in the Red Sea. Do you remember about that? When, when the Israelites passed, pa passed went, on, went, on, went, went through the Red Sea on dry ground, when God parted the seas. You remember the story of the Exodus? Remember that story? When God put ten plagues upon Egypt? Remember that story? Well, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh had hardened his own heart so many times to the things of God and to the people of God, there came a point when God himself hardened Pharaoh's heart. So Pharaoh couldn't repent. That's what the Bible teaches you. God hardened him. God, the Bible says God hardens who he wants to harden, softens who he wants to soften. So at the end of the day is that, you know, when people say, oh, well, what about these, what about mass murderers? What about pedophiles? You know, surely God won't forgive them. Listen, if someone can come to God, then God will receive them, the Bible says. But let me tell you this. There's some people that have done such terrible things that God don't grant a repentance. There's some people that have done such awful things they can't come to God. It's not possible. It means they're going to burn. They're going to go in the lake of fire eventually. That's it. That God will harden their heart. The, that is a biblical teaching. And it's not something which is often said because when you go to churches, often people don't speak that way. But you read the Bible for yourself. You'll see it's there. It's there. So if you can come to God, you know, you can come to God. If, if you can come to God, Jesus said, anyone who comes to me will not turn away. It means there's forgiveness of sin, brand new life, brand new, being born again of the spirit in Christ. That's what God will offer you. And, and, and with that, a place in heaven, sins washed away in a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. If you can come to God. And it's good to find out whether you can come to God or not. That's the thing. Don't wait. Don't leave it. Don't Because you know, never know what's going to happen in the rest of your life. If you leave it, you might be to come now, but you think, no, I'm not coming now. I know it's all true, but I'm not ready. You want to, today is the day of salvation, God says. It's not about waiting until you're on your deathbed. Because by the time you get on your deathbed, your heart could have grown so hard, so, so calloused over towards the things of God. You could be such a, you could be such a different person than what you are right now. That it could be that you can't come to God. It's too late. It could be like that. It could be. So don't take the risk with your life. God loves you. He wants to see you saved. He wants to see you safe in his arms. He wants to come into your life. He wants to save you. That's what he wants to do. And he wants to help you and deliver you from sin. Now, listen, you people say, oh, well, hold on a minute. I love my sin. Do you? The thing is, sin might seem nice at the time, but it ultimately is destructive. It might seem nice, but it's ultimately destructive. And what you'll find is that as God sets you free, I used to smoke marijuana at one time. When God set me free from that, and that was gone out of my life, do you know my life improved? My life actually got better. I enjoyed life more without it than what I did with it, even though at the time when I was stuck in, in that, in that uh, rut of smoking that stuff, you know, I would drive all over the place just to get a bit, just to get a little bit of puff, you know, because it was so important to me. But once Christ come into my life and me praying, repentant and asking God to deliver me and realizing it wasn't of the Lord, it wasn't God's will in my life. God set me, got God in his time. He set me free and I was better off. So that goes for all sin. Anything which God says is sinful in your life, you'll find you'll be happier and better without it. I can promise you. I can absolutely promise you. Hand on heart. I can promise you. You'll have a better life. You want a good life? everybody wants a good life that's the reason why people do the things they do often it's because they just want fun they want a good life do you know a good life the best life you can have is a life in christ a life when you've got god in your life a life when you could because you know what blessed means blessed blessing blessing means blissfully happy that's what it means and god blesses those that come to him so that the happiness is inside Happiness, people in the world, they think happiness is about, you know, I mean, we all need money. We, 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 we all need lots of things in the world. But the point of it is, is that you can have all that stuff and still be unhappy. But if you come to God, you can have an happiness and a joy inside. You can have, even, even when everything else seems to be falling apart all around you, you can have an happiness and a peace and a joy inside of you because you've got God in your life. And you've got also is the fact as you pray, miracles can happen around you. Which means that you can fix some of the problems that you've got or the th problems you see in other people's lives just through the word of god 
and prayer. So Jesus saved me. It's met all those years later, eventually I, I ended up with bad knees, which come about a different way because I was uh, basically, I hadn't trained legs for a while and I was doing leg press uh, with one of the strongest guys in the club. And, um, and I ended up by allowing the wet leg press machine to come right down on me. Uh, it it put, didn't put me in a very strong position and I injured my hip. And uh, I, had a, I had a bad hip and, bad, and I ended up with bad knees for about 10 years. That's a long while to be praying, a long while to be asking God, a long while to be trusting God. But within that time, I carried on in the Lord. Within that time, I carried on praying. I was praying for people, witnessing, testifying, seeing people, seeing God heal other people, seeing God miraculously work in other people's lives while I limped along. But one day, the Lord took me around a, a, um, a couple of Christ, a Christians' houses, uh, Alan and Betty Tang from Ockenden born again Christian, lovely, lovely Christian family. As I walked through the door, got the Holy Spirit, the Lord prompted me to ask for prayer, which I did. I asked for prayer. Would you please pray for my knees? Because my, my knees was the thing that was playing up at the time. I was like an old man, couldn't walk about, couldn't kick a ball, got that bad. They said, they, they sat me down, he put his hands on my knees and he prayed. His wife was at the back with her hand on his shoulder, crying out to God. She's crying out to God in that heavenly language. And he's just saying, Lord Jesus, please heal Stan's knees. And he asked in a few different ways, just typically asking, just normal, like Jesus, please heal his knees. Jesus, heal his knees. You know, just asking God to heal my knees. Do you know, I got up out of there and I was completely healed, completely healed. I come back in the gym, healed. Within that first, within a few days, I've got under a squat rack, even though it was difficult because I'd lost some flexibility in my shoulders. I'm nearly 60 years old now. But the thing is, I, I got under the squat rack and within a, I could go up and down and squat, squat with the weights, knees never hurt. Within about a week or two weeks, I'd squatted 300 pounds in a full squat. It was difficult for me because I hadn't been training legs and I'd been, you know, for all those years. But nevertheless, I was still had some strength in me and I managed to squat 300 pounds for just, just for one rep. My knees never hurt. I've got new knees. I didn't need a knee replacement. It's okay if you have to have a knee replacement and that's what God does in your life and you have a knee replacement, fine. Thank God for modern science and for the technology within the me medical healthcare and this stuff. Thank God for all those things. If you need to use those things, use them. When I, you know, if I, need, if I need antibiotics, I'll go to the doctors and get some antibiotics. I'll still pray, Lord, please heal me of whatever it is, but I'll go to the doctors if need be. But God gave me new knees. He gave me new knees. He fixed my shoulder and he's done so many miracles in my life. I could, I could, there's many things I could tell you, many, many things that I could tell you that are just incredible that only God could have done in my life. Now, I know when you see me wandering around the gym and saying, I don't get a chance to say all these things to you. Of course I don't. You know, you're, you come here to, to hear about the gym. You come here to, to train, to get big and strong and to like, you know, perhaps, you know, we've got powerlifters here. We, we have powerlifting competitions. Um, if we can, we have them every year. Uh, Matthew Lewis won the last powerlifting competition. He is the reigning champion. We have strongman competitions outside. We had one last year now. We only had one so far. We've had a strongman competition. Matthew Lewis won that as well. He's a local postman, but he's a, a very strong young, young man, incredibly strong. And he's been training, I think, about seven, six, seven, eight years. He's very, very strong. And um, I think he weighed 80 and a half kilogram and he deadlifted. 260 kilogram i think that's i think that's what he deadlifted and i think he bench pressed 145 kilogram and i think he squatted 195 kilogram very very powerful young man but he went up against the strongest guys in the club and there was some guys quite close to him but at the end of the day you know he's, he's the reigning champion so we have powerlifting champions strongman competitions i don't get a chance to talk about all these things about the lord to everyone in the club that's why i'm making this video just to encourage your faith in jesus christ to know that whatever problems you're having, even you're having problems in your marriage, God can fix them. If you're having problems, if, if whatever's going on, whatever's wrong in your life, start talking to Jesus about it and have faith. Serve God in your life. Find out about what God wants done in your life. I'll just say this before we go. Often I say, that Jesus says you must be born again of the Spirit to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew, Matthew uh, sorry, John 3 verse, verse 3. John 3 verse 3, you must be born again when the kingdom of heaven. A lot of people don't understand that. They think to themselves, why is that then? Just quickly is that the law of God, the Ten Commandments, all the moral laws of God, when you look at them, you break them. That's called sin and it condemns you before God. So everyone under the law of God is condemned already. It means if you die in the night, you're going to hell. Then you come before God on judgment day. God is vindicated because then you realize why you've gone to hell. 
and then you get cast in like eternal punishment lake of fire that seems really extreme but it was really only for the devil and the angels that's what god created hell for the devil and the lake of fire but because the devil tricked man in the garden of eden and because the, the mankind has bowed his knee to sin and the, the devil because of that mankind is, un, is is revealed in under the law of god we break god's laws what means we're sinners we're condemned no matter how many good things you try and do you're still staying condemned you're under god's laws and you've broken them that's the reason why christ came to pay the death penalty for the sins of the world so he paid the death penalty for your sin and for mine when god became flesh so he hung on that cross when he said it is finished it meant the debt of mankind's sin is now fully paid for and he died and of course he rose again on that third day and commissioned his disciples to go out and preach the gospel of which that word come to me god saved me and that's what i'm doing so other people would know there's a way to heaven there's a way to be forgiven by god so when so when christ died for your sin rose again it's him that says you must be born again the reason why he says that is because if you receive a new life you're no longer under the law of god if you receive a new life in christ you become a new creature, a new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You get the new life in God. God now lives in you. There was a time when God didn't live in you. Now he does live in you. You've got this new life. You're no longer under the law of Moses that, con that condemns you in the sight of God. You're under grace in Christ. And you're saved by grace through faith in Jesus and the shed blood that he shed at Calvary for you and me. And because you're now under grace, God promises to never leave you nor forsake you. Now, if you leave the Lord, if you go off and start getting involved in organized crime and you and you start living just back in there, you forget God, deny God. Jesus said, if you deny the Lord, he'll deny you on the day of judgment. God is not a God who can be fooled. He can't be mocked. But you slip up into sin as you go on in your Christian life. You slip up. God forgives you. You ask the Lord to forget you're forgiven. You're saved by grace through faith. It's not by your works. God will just continue to work in your life so that you don't slip up so much. So you don't you don't do them things anymore that's the whole point of progressive sanctification god working his way out in your life working his way out to, throughout your life so that you have become more godly you enjoy your life more you enjoy life more you don't fall into the pitfalls of life all the temptations of life to go into go in the wrong direction jesus will lead you out because you're saved by grace through faith and you have a place in heaven so if you die in the night you go straight to be with the lord because you're forgiven you've you've been you've been set free set free from the eternal consequences of your sins now isn't that good news that's what you really want you know when you go to a funeral right everybody when you go to a funeral and my, my father passed away a couple of years ago we've all been to a lot of funerals and, it, and it, even funerals are always a tragedy because you're missing the person that's gone but the point is is when you go to a funeral you expect the man at the front there or the woman nowadays to say something nice to give the, the, the congregation hope of an afterlife to, to give them hope if you had someone stand up there and they went well you know they're dead now we'll never see them again and um you know there is no heaven and uh you know there, there's that when you're dead you're dead if someone stood up there in a few at the funeral and stood and said something like that to the congregation you can bet your life there'd be there'd be all sorts of trouble because people in the congregation that don't really think much about god at all don't even really think too much about eternity or anything they don't want to hear that they want to hear some hope so when we're in a in that situation where in in, in a funeral and you you know deep down in your you, the loved ones that you've passed away you would hope they've gone to a better place what the bible says is there's only one way to get to that better place and that's through jesus christ so our hope god is a god of hope that god reached them before they passed away which is quite possible because God loves people and he's by his spirit he reaches people even in the middle of the night he's ministering to them they're counting they're thinking about their eternity about where they're going to go the gospel message has reached them at some point in their life and they're now saying Jesus forgive all my sin I give my life to you and they've entered the kingdom and they've passed away and they've gone to be with the Lord but perhaps you always knew him as an atheist you always oh my dad was an atheist no he wasn't perhaps he wasn't perhaps he wasn't Perhaps towards the end of his life, God reached him and he's in the kingdom now. And the only way you're ever going to see him is if you accept Christ as your way, the way of salvation. You can't lose. With Jesus, you cannot lose. You cannot lose having God in your life. Anyway, it's been lovely to speak with you or, or for, for me to be able to speak with you. Um, obviously, clearly, if you want to speak to me about anything at all, please come and talk to me about it. But 
Uh, it, it, to be fair, whenever people come to the club and stuff like this, I normally just talk about weights and training and getting big and strong. And getting, I train with you. And most of the time, you know, 90 or percent, 99% of the time, I don't get a chance to talk about the Lord unless you ask me. If you ask me, I will tell you, you know, what God has, was revealed to me. Um, and can I just leave this with you is that, you know, please give God a chance in your life. You won't regret it. So, of course, our goal here at, at a conference like this, one of our main goals is to uh, help the body of Christ uh, understand how scientific findings can be interpreted from the biblical worldview. That's one of our main objectives. So, uh, scientific findings like the fossil record, it's very, very important that we're able to correctly interpret those, that we can interpret those from the biblical worldview. So, much of what we focus on are those important subjects. But uh, through science, we can also, in science, we're exploring God's creation, which is a marvelous, marvelous thing. And through an e this exploration and through the teachings by, of science, we can develop a better appreciation of who our God is. But unfortunately, we live in a world that teaches a different worldview. In secular schools today, as we've, as we've heard from previous talks, the scientific community is dominated by a philosophy of naturalism. They're dedicated to explaining our world as coming about through purely natural processes. And their view is that all life on earth has descended from one common ancestral form a long time ago that developed eventually into ape-like ancestors that eventually gave rise to man. This is the view of the scientific community by and large. They, they stand in agreement with this, these teachings. And that's what your kids are being taught in public schools. So what I hope you're going to hear a little bit today is the difference. How science can be taught from the biblical worldview. And I hope when you hear this presentation, maybe you'll question a little bit the uh, decision of having, your, having kids in the secular schools today. How can they come out of secular schools today with a correct worldview, with a correct understanding of our world? I spend all week in, in schools being taught a secular, an atheistic worldview, and then one, one hour, maybe two hours at church being taught a biblical worldview. How can we, how's that possibly a balance that can lead to a healthy understanding of the world that we live in? But there is an alternate way of, of interpreting Earth's history, and so that's one of our goals. The scientific community believes that man evolved from ape-like ancestors, but the Bible speaks of man very much differently. Psalms, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, the son of man that you care for him? Yet you made him a little lower than God and crowned him with glory and honor. The NIV renders that little lower than the heavenly beings, but the NASB, which by all accounts is a better rendering of those original texts, the Hebrew and the, the Latin versions, renders that a little lower than God. We're not the, like the animals. We know this. We're not like the animals. We did not descend from animals. We are distinct. <clears throat> it's within biology that we see most of the evidence of design that's within God's creation. There's a lot of cosmological design as well. Through the study of astronomy, we learn all about the fine-tuning of the universe all the physical constants that must be exactly the way they are for life to exist anywhere. But from within biology, most of the just really amazing examples of design are found. And so we want to kind of look at some of those. I mean, from bottom to top, the human body is an, ex an extraordinary example of God's creative power. From the DNA that's in our cells, there is information within all living cells. Information, DNA is an instruction that tells a cell how to make proteins, which are all the machinery that makes life possible. DNA is information. Everything we know of information says it comes from an intelligent source. The fact that we find information in the cell should lead us inexorably to the conclusion that the cell also must have come from an intelligent source. And scientists know this. They know it's information, and yet they stand firm in their belief that this information just popped into existence through purely natural process. An extraordinary amount of information can be found within these cells. There are three billion base pairs of DNA in the average human genome, three billion. By comparison, 
One human cell contains about as much information as you will find in a thousand books. Or a millimeter pile of DNA contains about as much information as 500 stacks of books reaching to the moon. Or a single stack of, stack of books reaching to the sun. It's an incredible amount of information. But unfortunately, we have inherited a lot of scientific thinking that came before us. Scientists from in Darwin's day viewed the cell very much differently than we view it, than we know it today. One of the most famous evolutionists of Darwin's day, Ernest Haeckel, described the cell this way. And by the way, her, Ernest Haeckel named the bacterial kingdom, the kingdom Monera. He named the bacterial kingdom. He describes the cell like this. And this is in 1883. Darwin's works were published in the 1850s in later revisions, 1883. Not, the cell's not composed of any organs at all, but consists entirely of shapeless, simple, homogeneous matter. It's nothing more than a shapeless, mobile little lump, lump of mucus or slime. When that's your view of the cell, that it's nothing but a little lump of mucus or slime, it's easy to envision a way of such a thing forming in a little pond full of scum, if that's your view of the cell. Easy to think about the cell forming all on its own through pretty natural processes. But we know that the cell is far from that today. The cell is a vastly complex construct. Even today, we really do not fully grasp everything that's happening there in the cell. We know the big processes, but there's so much going on and we're discovering new things every day. In the human body, there are approximately 100 trillion cells. And the human body makes well over 1 million cells per second million cells per second and that's a very conservative estimate in fact you make more than a million red blood cells per second An extraordinary amount of processing take place today we know that the cell is vastly more complex than they viewed it in darwin's day an evolutionist michael denton turned uh, intelligent design advocate described the cell this way in his book evolution of theory and crisis he says to grasp the reality of life as, as it has been revealed by molecular biology we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. Nothing but a little lump of mucus or slime in Darwin's day, back to our day, an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. This is how the cell is viewed today. And it's these cells in the human body that are responsible for all the processes that take place. Cells of a variety of different types make up all of the organs, the tissues, the organs and systems within our body. There are four main types of cells that make up every organ in the body. So your stomach has some connective tissue, your blood cells, your blood itself is considered connective tissue. It has some epithelial tissue, some skin, some muscle tissue, some nervous tissue, every organ in the body contains these general types of tissues. Organs like the liver, extraordinarily complex, extraordinarily complex organs in the human body. The liver itself is the chemical factory for the human body, is a chemical factory. It's been estimated to process at least 500 different functions. The liver itself has at least 500 different functions. It regulates the composition of the blood, including your blood sugar levels, protein levels, fat levels. It removes toxins from the blood, like alcohol, which is a toxin. People that drink a lot end up having liver problems because of overworking the uh, liver in this way. It processes or metabolizes most of the nutrients, stores some nutrients, produces su important substances like cholesterol and many proteins, and it produces the blood clotting factors. When discussing biological systems, it becomes difficult to identify what the organs that belong to this specific system or to discuss an organ in relation to one system because in reality, many organs are involved with multiple dis different systems within the human body, such as the liver. You need multiple different types of cells to make an organ. So on, at every level, the Biological systems within the human body illustrate what we call irreducible, irreducible complexity. One of our speakers talked about irreducible complexity before. But it, you need several different types of cells to make an organ. You can't have an organ without all of those different types of cells pre-existing. You have to have several different types of organs to make up a biological system. 
Your various systems, like circulatory system, nervous system, digestive system, endocrine system, all require multiple different types of organs. All of those organs must exist simultaneously for that system to exist. What Darwinists must explain is how something like the complex human body came about through slow and gradual processes over long periods of time. But in fact, at every level, you see irreducible complexity. You see irreducible complexity within various structures within the cell, like the flagellum or ATP synthase complex proteins that cannot function unless every single component of that protein exists. Things like the org an organ cannot exist unless every single component of that organ is in place. Biological systems cannot exist unless every single organ that makes up that biological system exists. And the psalmist probably does the best job of, of uh, describing this. For you formed me for you formed my inner inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it well. When studying the human body, we are confronted with the designer behind the seemingly interwoven components that underlie the, the, the human body. From the DNA molecule, which is self-thread-like, to the cell-to-cell-to-cell -cell -to -cell communication, or the interconnectedness of the various organs that make up systems. No cell or system in the body works independently of any other. They are knit together just as the psalmist describes. At every level, there is example of irreducible complexity. You have to have these multiple components existing at one time for them to function. And, and Darwinists have to explain how these things come about through slow and gradual additions of individual components. Let's just go through some of these systems. I want to just illustrate some of the marvelous designs that we find in the biological systems. The skeletal system is made up of some 206 bones. At least the adult body has some 206 bones. More than half of those are in the hands and feet. A newborn has something closer to 350 bones because many of those fuse together. The skeletal system works together with the muscular system to accomplish movement and also protects internal organs. So systems work together. The skeletal system is also responsible for making new cells for the circulatory system and the immune system. These systems are interconnected. And very recently, it was discovered that the skeletal system is also involved with the endocrine system, uh, the system that makes the hormones, the chemical messages that are released by glands in your body that tells some other part of your body what to do. We now know that the skeletal system is, is also part of the endocrine system. These systems are highly interconnected. Bone is itself an extraordinary substance, stronger than granite. Your compact bone is stronger than granite. A block of bone half the size of a computer mouse can support 10 tons, four times the capacity of concrete. And unknown to many, the bones are actually constantly remodeling themselves. You have cells in your bones called osteoclasts that are constantly eating away at the bone and then that bone is rebuilt by other cells called osteoblasts. So your bones are constantly remodeling themselves. The bones that you have now are not the same as the bones you had 10 years ago or 20 years ago. They're constantly remodeling themselves to meet the specific demands that you're placing upon them. You've heard the expression, uh, you know, people that are real big, you know, you'll hear an expression for people that are like real big saying, oh, I'm just, I'm just look big because I'm big boned. You ever heard someone say they're big, just big boned? Yeah. Well, it, in, in, in one way, it's true, but you're not uh, big because you're big boned. Your bones are big because you're heavy. Your, your bones are actually retooled to meet the additional mass that you're placed upon them. Or if you have a chance, look at someone that's involved with some sport or activity that requires a lot of stress on particular parts, parts of their appendage, just like their hands. Look at the hands of a person that's a professional rock climber, for example and you'll see the additional bone development that has taken place because of the additional stresses they put, along, put upon that particular part of their body. Your bones, specific joints in your bones have inspired uh, engineers to develop robotic joints. Stuart Burgess published this article in the Journal of Mechanisms and Robotics describing the work that he had done developing a robotic knee joint after studying the human knee joint. It's, it's big business today. It's what, call, it's what we call biomimicry. The, you, you study biological systems, biological components, and use those to develop or improve our own technologies. And many 
things that we use on a daily basis have been developed through biomimicry. Velcro was developed through biomimicry. Um, the, they're developing adhesives after studying the gecko's feet, the way geckos can stick to walls. Turbine, the blades, the turbines for your big windmills have been uh, modified based on studying humpback whale fins. They're developing a, a swimwear after studying, studying shark skin. Uh, and things like uh, display devices for cell phones are being designed after studying the way butterfly wings reflect light back in iridescent light. So a lot of things are, are improved upon by studying biological systems. It's what we call biomimicry. And Stuart Burgess uh, reports this in uh, this journal of mechanisms and robotics in 2013. But in 1999, he discusses this exact research in the journal of creation. Stuart Burgess is a creation scientist. And in 1999, in the uh, Journal of Creation, which is the technical publication by Creation Ministries International, he reports on this research. Uh, so they, Creation Ministries International, we, got, we have Taz Walker and Michael Lord in the house. They have a booth back there. They've, they've already talked about Creation Magazine. Cre the Journal of Creation is the more technical version. So if you want something a little with a little more meat to it, Consider stopping back there and get you a, a subscription to the Journal of Creation. But he describes his work with the knee joint in the Journal of Creation back in 1999 and some of the same figures that were used in his 2013 report are present there. But he describes the knee as irreducibly complex. He says, opponents of neo-Darwinian evolution have argued that it is impossible because many biological systems require an irreducible number of parts for a system to have useful function. An irreducibly complex system is one that has to have multiple parts to function, and the loss of even one part will cause the system to no longer work. And that's what makes an irreducibly complex system so difficult to explain through Darwinian mechanisms, because they have to explain how something that we now have came into existence by slowly and gradually adding parts. But if it won't exist, if you even remove one part, how is a Darwinian evolutionist going to explain how something comes about in that way? He, re, he continues, the concept of irreducibly, irreducibility requires a set of characteristics that must exist simultaneously. Such characteristics are termed critical characteristics. The advantage of identifying critical characteristics is that they give an indication of the minimum quantity of design information that must exist simultaneously in the genetic code for a mechanism to have any useful function. The irreducible mechanism of the knee joint, he says, for example, is shown to contain at least 16 critical, critical characteristics, each requiring thousands of precise units of information to exist simultaneously in the genetic code. This demonstrates that the knee could not have evolved, but must have been created or as a fully functional limb joint from the beginning of its existence. Irreducibly complex. From bottom to top. DNA to specific cellular structures like, back, like flagellum and ATP synthase, to specific organs, to biological systems, even individual joints. It would just be complex from, bo from bottom to top. The nervous system is remarkable. Your nerves serve to communicate information from one part of the body to another. For example, from sensory organs to effector organs like muscles, to this, from the central nervous system out to your muscles. It connects sensory system to response systems. There are nearly 45 miles of nerves running throughout the human body. Now, the functional cell of the nervous system is what we call a neuron. A neuron is a cell that basically transmits an electrical signal from one part to another. This video, a little bit difficult to see on this, just shows some neurons growing out. Neuron is a long thread-like structure. The longest nerve in the human body is about three feet in length and runs from where it connects with your spinal cord all the way out to the muscles in your calf. You have individual nerves that are three feet in length. In a giraffe's neck, there are some that are closer to 15 feet in length, a single neuron. There are approximately 100 billion neurons in the human body total. One billion in the spinal cord alone. These individual neurons connect with other neurons and or effector organs like muscles. An average neuron will make between 1,000 and 10,000 connections or what we call synapses. For, and there are 100 trillion synapses minimum in the human body. It's an extraordinary number of connections. The brain is itself just a mass of neurons, neurons connected together. Mark uh, Cosgrove is a professor of psychology at Taylor University, and he describes the brain this way. 
The brain is a swarm of cells in which everything is seem seemingly connected to everything else. The connections, though, follow a plan or an order. Your brain is just a mass of these neurons, all connecting with one another. But it's still debated today whether all of the mind actually is localized within the brain, because the entire nervous system are neurons connected to one another. There's a big cluster of them up in here, but is all the mind localized to the brain? This is something people still debate. The brain itself is an extraordinary organ. At the adult brain weighs about three pounds, 2% of the body's total weight, but uses 25% of the body's oxygen and or eight and energy, 25% of its glucose, 25% of its ATP energy, although it only consists about 2% of the human body. Some brain cells make up to 200,000 connections with other brain cells. There's an estimated 60 to 240 trillion connections in the cerebral cortex alone. Connections. Werner Gitt has a doctorate in engineering and was a former head of the Department of Information Technology at the German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology. You can find a couple of books from Werner Gitt back there in the back. He stated in the journal, The Third Fundamental Quantity, that without a doubt, the most complex information processing system in existence is the human body. If we take all human information processes together, Conscious ones, consciousness ones and unconscious ones. This involves the processing of 10 to the 24 bits of information daily. This astronomically high figure is higher by a factor of 1 million times than the total human knowledge of bits stored in all the world's libraries. It's an extraordinary processing center. And still the evolution of the brain remains a mystery today. In, the, press, in uh, the preface to the evolution of the brain in 1989, John Eccles states that while recognizing that much is unknown or only imperfectly known, I have been able to unfold the fascinating story of the hominid, brain, hominid evolution of the human brain using creative imagination restrained by rational criticism. An important... Uh, accessory to the brain, the eye. The eye is actually in some books considered a part of the human brain. It is so well integrated in the brain that the eye is actually considered by some to be actually part of the brain. And it actually performs a lot of processing, the kinds of processing that we attribute to the brain. The eye is an, is an extraordinary organ. It contains over 10 million specialized cells called photoreceptors that are found in the retina the back portion of the eye, packed into an incredibly high density of 200,000 per square millimeter. There are two types of cells in the retina called rod and cone cells, aptly named because that's how they're shaped. One is rod shaped, the other is cone shaped. The cone shaped cells uh, are, are those that detect color. The rod shaped cells are those that detect only a, bl a, a black and white. The rod shaped cells in particular are extremely sensitive. They can respond to light far below our own technology and can, in fact, respond to as few as one photon of light. So it's because of this, consequently, if you're, when the light, when it's very dark, things look black and white to you, that's because you're only seeing at that point in time with the rod cells. The cone cells are not activated by such low light levels. And the eye performs a lot of pre-processing. 10 billion calculations actually occur within the retina every second before the image actually gets sent to the brain. Let me show you a short clip about the eye from uh, the documentary, God of Wonders. It moves about 100,000 times each day with automatic focusing and can handle 1.5 million simultaneous messages. The eye is also self-cleaning with built-in wipers and cleaning fluid. And the eye even has the amazing ability to assemble and heal itself. Furthermore, God has designed the human eye to distinguish millions of colors and his mind to appreciate the rich spectrum of beauty seen throughout creation. Most people don't realize this, but the eye is part of the brain. It's an extension of bud in the embryo that buds off the brain. And there's a little window 
that develops in the skin called the cornea of the eye. Isn't that great? The eyeball is located precisely where a clear window develops in the skin, so we may look through. It's sensitive to light over a range of about 10 billion to one. That is from the brightest uh, thing we can see, maybe a sun-drenched snowscape, uh, down to as little as a single photon of light. That's our smallest unit of light. And of course, everywhere you look, the focus is automatic. And the two eyes look at the same spot wherever we look. Uh, it's like somebody with a pair of six guns that can fire the guns, and everywhere they shoot, the two bullets make one hole instantly, everywhere. And that's what our eyes are doing. Everywhere we look, they converge in the same point. If they were off by just a degree or so, you'd see double. Everywhere I look, I see overwhelming evidence of the handiwork of God. And surely, when man denies that, he's without excuse, just as Romans chapter 1, verse 20 tells us. Darwin himself spoke to the difficulty of explaining the evolution of the human eye. He says, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. But then he actually goes on to explain how he believes the eye could have evolved, which really amounted to little more than comparing different eyes of different complexities. This one's very simple. This eye, the eye in this organism is very simple. The eye in this organism is a little more complex. The one in this organism is very complex. And here's a much more complex one. Didn't actually explain how something like that could evolve. Just, just pointed out several different levels of, of uh, ocular complexity. The respiratory system, also amazingly complex. The job of the lung is to exchange gases with the atmosphere, breathes in oxygen and discards uh, carbon dioxide uh, that results from the breakdown of sugars by the cells. The uh, main functional organ of the lungs is these little sacs that called alveoli that are there to uh, increase surface area. But to, to illustrate just how much surface area they provide, if you were to flatten out all of those sacs, they would cover an area of about the size of a tennis court. So there's about as much surface area in your lungs as there is over the surface of a tennis court. And the lungs are remarkably self-cleaning. And think about how important this is. When you uh, see the, uh, the, the, the dust in your room, in your house, when the sun is shining through and you can see all that dust, or if you have a, you know, an air filtration system, just how quickly the filters in your air filtration system get clogged up. Think about all that debris in that air coming into your lungs on a daily basis. How long do you think your lungs would stay functional if they weren't self-cleaning? But you have these, you have cells in your lungs that secrete mucus. The reason why you actually have that mucus is part of the cleaning mechanism. And then, and then additional cells that have cilia, little hair-like structures that beat and they move all simultaneously wave-like functions to constantly move that mucus up and out of your respiratory passages to your esophagus where you swallow it. And at this point, I usually point out to my students something very gross about what's in that air, you know, the, the dead skin cells that that mostly is. And, you know, in a way, we're filter feeders. You know, there's a lot of filter feeders. You know, like clams, there's clams in the, uh, in the ocean that are pulling in water and they filter feed in basically the same way. The debris in the water gets stuck to mucus, cilia pull it back and they swallow that, all that debris. You know, and so in one way, we're filter feeding, except instead of uh, detritus from the ocean, you're Filter feeding the skin cells from your uh, siblings and your parents and stuff at home in a way effectively eating one another on a regular basis. This is awesome stuff you learn by going to Christian schools. I'm telling you, it's awesome, awesome. Circuitry system. The circuitry system contains o over 60,000 miles of blood vessels. In, the chi in a child's body, closer to 100,000 miles of blood vessels in an adult. Now to give you an idea of just how many how much that is, the Earth's circumference is 25,000 miles. So the blood vessels in an adult human body, if stretched out end to end, could actually go around the Earth four times. It's an extraordinary thing. Uh, there was a, the bodies exhibit has come to Seattle a couple of times, and I took my human anatomy and physiology classes there when it was here, and they had a couple of exhibits where they... They had managed to fill the circulatory system of an appendage, even there was one of the whole body, with uh, uh, like a latex substance and were able to eat away the rest of the tissue. So all you saw was the, hand, the arm or the, hand, the circulatory system in the arm and the hand. 
and it looked like the entire thing was nothing but circulatory tissue. It's a remarkable thing. The heart, of course, is the powerhouse of the circulatory system, constantly beating to moving blood throughout your body. <clears throat> it beats over 100,000 times in one day, 40 million times in a year, and 3 billion times during the average human lifespan. It pumps a total of 1.5 gallons every minute. That's enough to fill a 50 gallon drum per day. A million barrels in the average human life, lifespan. It is an enormously hard working organ. If your voluntary muscles, your uh, skeletal muscles try to do what the heart does, they would burn out in no time at all. But the heart just keeps doing that over and over and over. We can't design anything like the heart. In one hour, the heart outputs the energy necessary to lift 2,000 pounds a meter off the ground in one hour. So every hour, your heart could basically lift a small car or a big animal off the ground every hour. Now, how, how long do you think it would take before your arms and legs would tire out trying to do something like that? But your heart can do that hour after hour after hour. Now, one of the most extraordinary things about the circulatory system is, is the blood clotting system. And so you have this extraordinary uh, ability to stop the flow of blood whenever you're cut and, you're, and your blood starts to leak out, this extraordinary clotting system. Like many of the biochemical reactions within the human body, it, this one is extraordinarily complex, but must be because all of the components that are necessary for your blood to clot exist there within your blood. And if there wasn't close, really careful regulation that prevented it from clotting until necessary, your blood could essentially solidify at any point in time. But, and this is a typical diagram that shows all the feedback mechanisms, the check loops that are involved with making sure your blood only clots absolutely when necessary. But uh, uh, rather than trying to explain your way through this, I'm gonna just let an expert uh, handle this for me. Here you go. I cut my finger this morning, and it's bleeding. But if I put this bandaid on, it'll stop in a while. Did you ever wonder how it happens? I mean, does blood just stop? Because that's what it's supposed to do? Why doesn't our blood clot before we get it cut? I guess we just die then, because all our blood would harden up and stop flowing. Did you ever wonder? Did you ever wonder why? Blood clotting is a very complex process involving thousands and millions of triggers that have to act just perfectly with one another to create the final outcome. Let me see if I can tell you how this works. First, you get a little cut like mine. Imagine you're in my bloodstream. There's a bunch of traffic going on, and pretend you're floating around with a kajillion other red blood cells, all with oxygen backpacks. Everything slows down when you get near the cut. This is called vascular constriction. In short, your body limits the flow near the cut because it knows something is wrong. And of course, you feel pain. So, a protein in your body called fibrinogen arrives on scene. Fibrinogen is primarily responsible for stimulating platelet clumping, which essentially cuts off the ends of the fibrinogen. Platelets clump by binding to collagen. Upon activation, platelets release adenosine 5 diphosphate ADP and TXA2, which activate additional platelets, serotonin, phospholipid, liver proteins, and other important proteins for the coagulation cascade. Activated platelets change their shape to accommodate the formation of the plug. Oh, sorry, I digress. Anywho, this complex thing called the Stewart factor converts prothrombin to thrombin, thereby converting fibrinogen to fibrin. By the way, the Stewart factor wasn't active until it was activated by the Christmas factor. Okay, there's a lot more to this process, like this goes there, and binding, receptin, who knows what. It's very complicated, but the net result is a clot. Stops the bleeding, cut heals, clot dissolves, you're on your way. Isn't that neat? Okay, one, of the, one other important uh, function that the circulatory system plays, although you could argue this, is do you discuss the immune system in the circulatory system or a lymphatic system or, a, you know, a skeletal system also plays a role here, is the immune system. And the immune system is itself incredibly complex. 
Uh, and it's, it, I, will, I will refer back to this later, but it, it, there, there are a number of cells in the immunity system that all work together in concert to help protect you from all the pathogenic organisms that are out there that could cause harm. Uh, bacteria and viruses, fungus, even your own cells can at some point cause harm. Those that uh, become cancerous, for example, are ultimately fought and destroyed by the immunity system. A number of cells are responsible for this. A number of highly specialized cells, some uh, that eat other cells. There are cells in your body that eat other cells called macrophages and neutrophils. But all of these specialized cells come from one stem cell in the bone marrow. So this one cell eventually becomes all these other cells due to what's called a, 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 due to the alteration of what's called the regulation of expression. So they, all cells in the body have the exact same DNA. All of these cells have the exact same DNA, but these different specialized cells, much like the different specialized cells I mentioned before, the nerve cells and the muscle cells and your, and in this case, your red blood cells, these individual specialized cells develop because in one cell, certain genes are turned on and other genes are turned off, but in a different kind of specialized cell, completely different genes are turned on and off. It's what they call gene regulations. What genes are active in producing proteins are regulated carefully to produce these various kinds of specialized cells. It's an extraordinary thing. All these come from one uh, type of, of uh, stem cell that comes from bone marrow. But like I say, your, your immune system actually has multiple systems that are involved in this process. Again, it, it, it irreducible of complexity at every level. How do you explain something like the origin of the immune system when it's involved, when so many systems are necessary for it to function? Circulatory system is necessary. Skeletal system is where the stem cells come from that produce not only red blood cells, but your white blood cells as well. The lymphatic system is kind of a parallel system to your circulatory system. That's where you find your nodes, the various lymph nodes and those kind of things are part of your uh, lymphatic system. And your tegumentary system, your skin, is also heavily involved in, in immunity as well. Now, one of, the, one of the main functions of the immunity system is, again, to fight foreign pathogens like these bacteria you see right here. These red cells in that picture are, and specifically the bacteria that cause food poisoning, salmonella. It's a, the bacteria salmonella, the one that causes food poisoning. When you get these kind of pathogenic organisms, they would, could eventually kill you if it wasn't for your immunity system. And one of the main fighters the, one of the main cells that's fighting to protect you are these uh, are cells like this one that eat other cells. This is a neutrophil. Uh, neutrophils uh, can only eat a few cells before they die. The macrophage, a much bigger cell eater, can eat many, like a hundred cells before it dies. But this is a picture of a neutrophil actually eating a rod-shaped bacteria. This is the bacteria that it's eating right here, this neutrophil. They they basically are, they are, are, are uh, involved in a process called phagocytosis. They basically can eat other things, just pull other things directly in. Here's a short video showing human root neutrophil cells crawling around inside your body. These are autonomous, independent cells that cruise around your body like little mini blobs. Do you remember the movie, The Blob? The old movie, The Blob, this big blob-like thing that would swallow up people? Well, that's what your white blood cells are like. These big macro macrophage and neutrophils are phagocytic cells. Uh, they cruise around and then when they find something they need to eat, they'll surround it with these little feet-like extensions and they just pull it in straight in through their uh, cell membrane, kind of wrap their cells around it. These are just neutrophils responding to the presence of a bacterial infection, but they just cruise around through this human body. Now, very recently, we knew that the, these white blood cells use the circulatory system to move around inside the body. But only very recently, it was realized that they don't actually just get swept away in the circulatory system like your red blood cells. Instead, these white blood cells, like your neutrophils and macrophages, actually roll along the inside surface of your blood vessels, along the surface called the endothelium. They're actually rolling along the inside surface, making specific connections, protein to protein connections along the surface of the red blood cell as they move down the surface of the blood vessel. But then how do they know where to stop? Interesting discovery made there too, watch this. So you'll see here a bunch of red blood cells getting swept down through the circulatory system and along the surface, these are your white blood cells making these specific protein-protein connections with the endothelium on the inside of your blood vessel. But then at the site of inflammation, these proteins assemble 
a lipid raft forms beneath them, very newly discovered stuff. These proteins will then reach up, make contacts with those intracellular proteins, and when the neutrophil reaches them, they immobilize it. And then the neutrophil will spread out at its leading surface, squeeze itself between the individual cells that make up your blood vessel, enter your tissues, and go searching for the infection that's there. It's an extraordinary thing. It's an extraordinary thing. But I want to point out something else to you that's kind of cool about the immune system. Now, when you look at diagrams of the immune system, they kind of look like engineering diagrams, right? I mean, this is so crazy, crazy complex. But one thing I want to point out, so these individual spheres are those individual red blood cells, multiple types. But notice what's happening here, here, and here. Those two are making connections with one another. This is what they call antigen presentation. These cells, so cells like the neutrophils and macrophages, when they eat some foreign substance, like a virus or a bacteria or a fungus or even one of your own cells that's becoming, uh, that they need to destroy for whatever reason. When they eat one of these, what they end up doing is breaking it apart into pieces, and then they take one of those pieces that is referred to as an antigen, and they present it to another cell in the immunity system. It's what they call antigen presentation. It actually just extends it out of its cell, and these two match up, and one of them presents it to the other. That's what's happening right there. And this is part of the controlling mechanism, the activation mechanism that's responsible for what happens as a result of that antigen being present. So I found this particular antigen. That other cell then helps it determine what should happen from there. One of those is what's called a helper T cell. So this... This is like a macrophage one your, or one of your neutrophils presenting an antigen to this helper T cell. And then this helper T cell will decide, help it decide what happens after that. Do we make antibodies? Do we activate macrophages? Or do we activate killer T cells, which are the cells that destroy your cells in the event that you have a cancer or something? It's killer T cells. But it's this. I want to point out something about these antibodies. Antibodies are proteins that bind to antigens. Okay, so they're y loosely Y-shaped, little diagram of what an antibody might look like. And an antibody binds to a foreign particle that's called an antigen. Okay, but an antibody only binds to one antigen and one antigen alone. It's a lock and key system. It is customized to bind to only one thing. And these antibodies are in your plasma floating around. They're made by a specific cell called a B cell. They're floating around and within your, uh, uh, and when they bind to a foreign antigen, they can deactivate certain, like they can deactivate a virus or they label substances for destruction. So when they bind these, your immunity system then responds to them in various ways. Either they come around and the macrophage will eat them up if they're bound by antibodies, or in the case of viruses, it can actually uh, in, uh, dis deactivate them on a, on a level, okay? But one thing we've discovered so these gene, a gene is required to make the, a protein. That's what genes are. Genes are instructions that tell cells how to make proteins. And these antibodies are proteins that label foreign substances, okay? What we realize is that a, this, a gene to make an antibody is actually assembled from several templates. So there are several templates in your, on your chromosomes that are used to make antibodies. And what your cell does is it takes several of these templates, several of these subunits that it uses as templates, assembles them together. So it might splice these two together and then it moves, removes part of this one and then splices a couple more together and it move, may remove part of that one. And it ends up with a gene that it's gonna use to make an antibody, okay? This was discovered, a good, this was discovered quite a while ago, but right away they realized that the number of gene subunits that are there that can be recombined to make the final gene could in no way account for all the antibodies that are found in the human body. Because there's bazillions of antibodies in the human body. Every, an antibody will only label one foreign substance and one foreign substance alone. And you come across tons and tons of foreign things. But, and they realize there's no way that number of gene subunits could create that many antibodies. So they just figured out, they just decided based on their worldview, that when the cell is splicing together these various subunits, mutations happen. So when it splices them together, a little mutation happens here, it splices these, mutations happen, and these mutations can be responsible for all the incredible numbers of antibodies that are present in the human body. Until they eventually realized 
after the exposure to the antigen, this final gene is edited. With single nucleotide changes, it comes back and specifically edits that gene to make the exact protein that's necessary to bind to this foreign antigen. Now, I've said we would be mo so much further along in cell biology genetics if scientists just realized that what they were looking at was designed. They don't look for design, and so they don't find it. They assume everything's due to random mutations. You know, they had to stumble across it, that it was actually due to specific genetic recombination, specific edits to those that gene was made as a result of exposure to that antigen to make that antibody. It's an incredible thing. The origin of the immune system is still a mystery. There is still much debate in the journal Cell, Embryos, and Evolution. There's still much debate on how the vertebrate immune system evolved and even much less consistent on its relationship to the event system in invertebrates. One other interesting thing about the circulatory system, I don't know how well you're gonna be able to see this. Figure we got one light day in late September, but your circulatory system is involved in temperature regulation. So watch this carefully and see if you can see what's happening. You're your body is able to open and close blood vessels as needed to di divert blood into the areas where it wants it to go. Vasoconstriction, in that video she mentioned vasoconstriction, your body can constrict and dilate blood vessels to divert blood wherever it needs to go and does this for a number of reasons. That's what inflammation is as well. Your body is opening up blood vessels to divert blood in that area and help white blood cells get in there. But as well, when you get, like, when you get real hot, like when you're playing basketball or something and you realize your face gets red. You ever see someone playing, their face gets all red? That your body is opening up blood vessels at the surface to help it radiate off heat. Your body can specifically control what blood vessels are open and what blood vessels are closed at any given point in time. This is at the capillary level. It's an extraordinary level of control, extraordinary. But that may even pale in comparison to what takes place in fetal circulation. There's something remarkable that takes place in fetal circulation. Um, now the fetus, remember while it's still in the mother, does not, does not use certain organs because those processes are taking place by the mother. So things like the liver are not needed because the mother is taking care of all of those chemical reactions. Remember the, the liver is a, a chemical factory for the cell, but the mother's liver is taking care of all that chemical processing. And the lungs are not necessary because the mother is doing the breathing for the baby. So those are unnecessary, but they become necessary at the moment of birth. So what's kind of extraordinary about this is that uh, before birth, up until birth, these organs like the liver are completely bypassed. A blood vessel completely bypasses the liver. It sends enough blood into the liver to supply it with the nutrients to help the cells develop, but it also doesn't need the lungs. So the lungs are diverted too. Interestingly, there is a, a gap, a shunt between the right atrium and left atrium that allows blood just to go directly from the right atrium to the left atrium instead of going to the lungs. And when the blood leaves the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery contains a shunt that allows the blood to go, go directly into the aorta. So the lungs are completely bypassed. And then at the moment of birth, boom, everything changes. The shunt between the right atrium and right ventricle closes to force the blood out the pulmonary artery, and that shunt between the pulmonary artery and aorta close, so the blood goes through the lungs simultaneously, as well the diverting shunt there at the liver closes down, blood starts flowing through the liver, boom, at the moment of birth. It's extraordinary. But then again, fetal development in general is very, is very extraordinary. Fetal development is itself very, very extraordinary. God takes care of us from day one. That what takes place there in the mother's womb is just extraordinary. We, uh, a number of verses from the Bible talk about God's loving care of us. Uh, Jesus himself expresses great love for children. He says, in, in one case, he said, they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he, he was indignant and said to them, per permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. God loves us, and, take, and in particular, children. There's something very, very pure about children. <clears throat> Fetal development is probably a most, most remarkable because, again, remember, all of those specialized cells come from originally one cell. 
one cell. And through the regulation of gene expression, that one original cell, that egg that was fertilized by the sperm, that one cell in the very beginning becomes all of these highly specialized cells. Cells like nerve cells and muscle cells, uh, the rod and cone cells of the eye we've already talked about. Hair cells are the cells in the inner ear, your ear and or in, in your inner ear that are responsible for both hearing and balance. You have, you have cells that make these little hair, hairs. And when those hairs move, that's how you know that you're moving. Either that your head is moving or that you're accelerating forward or backward. It's because of these hair cells. Extraordinary. All of these specialized cells are made from one stem cell. And it's at the moment of fertilization that everything changes. Now, this is, I want you to just watch this real close. This is right after the moment of fertilization in a zebrafish. This is a time-lapse video, but it will kind of give you a sense of just how quickly things take place in early embryological development. As soon as fertilization takes place, the two genomes unite, cells start dividing, and as soon as you reach a critical mass, the minimum number, as soon as the minimum number of cells are reached, each of those cells is defined, is, is given a job. They're, ident they, they're given their identity, they begin to specialize to the individual specialized cells that they will eventually become, those specialized cells become tissues. Tissues eventually develop and start forming organs. Organs start forming biological systems. It, it's a process that takes place very rapidly. Now, of course, this is zebrafish. And humans are much more complex than zebrafish. Humans have three billion base pairs. But you probably might be surprised to note that in, that entire time lapse sequence was only 24 hours. From fertilization to there, only 21 hours. Of course, the process is much longer in humans. It actually takes 30 hours because of the increased size of the genome, the increased complexity of the human organism. It actually takes 30 hours for the first cell division to take place. About 15 hours later, it divides again. Three days later, you're up to 16 cells. After about five days, you've reached the stage called a blastocyst, the sphere there in the center. The outer cells will become the placenta. The inner cells will eventually become the baby. The blastocyst is carried down the fallopian tube by cilia, the same kind of cilia that are carrying your mucus out of your lungs. Then it becomes implanted in the placenta. During the next two to three weeks, everything changes after implantation. A disc forms in the center of the gastrula, the individual cells are assigned their roles. They start to migrate to different places within the growing fetus. And let's look at some of these stages. 32 days, two to three weeks at this stage. At 32 days, the heart and eye lenses become visible. The heart, liver, and pancreas are clearly visible. As at this stage, you can even already see fingers. The, the heart actually begins to pump at day 21. So day 32. Now at this, day, at this stage is when the first indications appear that a woman is even pregnant based on ovulation. The first indication that, the, that a pregnancy might be, uh, might be ongoing occurs at about this stage. And at this stage, not only is the heart already beating, heart, these, the many or, other organs are already present. 47 days at this point. Not only are fingers and toes clearly present, but the uh, face has also begun to form. Both nostrils and the mouth are clearly visible. At 56 days, it's at this stage actually that the developing embryo is actually referred to first as a fetus, but I would call it a baby at eight weeks. And it's sadly at this stage that most abortions take place at eight weeks. Now, all we can see is external anatomy on this, but to make this case a little stronger, I mean, I think this is one, the issue of abortion, I think, is one we need to wake up to. And I think when we look at this, when we analyze what really is taking place here in de and develop at these developmental stages and where a baby is at the time that, that abortion takes place, we really get an understanding of what's happening today. Now, this is also eight weeks. I want you to take a look at this video. This is a, a three-dimensional MRI video that was created at eight weeks. So in addition to the external anatomy, at this point, the 
transparency is, is not clear, but through an MRI, MRI, we can really get the sense of how fully developed this growing baby is. And this is at eight weeks. Everything is there. And it's at this week, at this stage, that again, most abor abortions take place. It's at this stage where Planned Parenthood will advise young girls that all that's there is just a massive tissue. They tend to emphasize how small it is. Oh, it's just the size of a blueberry. But whether we're 10 centimeters in size or 10 feet in size or 100 feet in size is irrelevant. Think about how big we are in comparison to God. A God that stretched out the vastness of the cosmos. When you consider the size of the cosmos, you really get a sense of just how big God is. Do you really think the difference between 10 centimeters and 10 feet is significant to God? It's not. It's clear that that is a baby. Everything is there. Everything is fully developed. And again, it's at this stage that most abortions take place, at eight weeks. There's some data. The graph is from 2002. The data below is from 2010, basically the same. Close to 60% take place at around the eight, you know, at eight weeks or, or less. More than 40% take place after eight weeks. More than 10% take place after 13 weeks. Just a, a few quick uh, statistics for you. By the age 45, about half of American women have an unintended pregnancy and nearly one third of those have an abortion. 85% of all abortions are performed on single women. Single women. There are about 1 million abortions per year. That's roughly about just less than 3,000 per day. And I, you know, I kind of wonder why it is that the church has become so silent on this issue. So silent on this issue. But then I stumbled across a, a statistic that might have made that uh, a little more clear. That 73% uh, of abortions are performed by couples that have re religious affiliations. 73%. Of abortions are performed by people with religious affiliations. This is a disturbing statistic. Disturbing statistic. And Jesus had some really harsh things to say about the mistreatment of children. And he called a child to himself and, and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child... He is the greater in the kingdom of heaven, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a, a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. I think we need to reawaken the church. We, are, we have become silent on this. We're so uh, involved with other, uh, with sins homosexuality having been uh, legalized. What is sexual acts between two consenting adults in comparison to the slaughter of a million babies per day in our country? I mean, this is something we need to reawaken, to reawaken ourselves to. We become desensitized to the horrors that are around us, desensitized to anything that has an emotional drive to it. The United States has some of the most uh, uh, of liberal abortion laws in the world. Every color there Every color there other than the blue has more stringent abortion laws than the United States. But that's changing. There's some good news. That's changing. We've seen a lot of legislation take place recently. In the last three years, between uh, 2011 and 2013, there were more restrictions enacted in that period than in the entire previous decade. So we are seeing some progress. But there's still some... Uh, up until recently, you were able to have an abortion at any stage in every state in the United States up until birth. That's how flexible the abortion laws were up until very recently. And still today, a girl can get an abortion without notifying her parents at an age where getting an aspirin at school is required. She can get an abortion at the same age without parent consent, yet at school she has to get parent consent to get an, have an aspirin administered. Now, how does this come about? It come about by lobbying efforts. Powerful lobbying groups. The whole drive behind this is money. This is huge money. It's an industry. Lobbying efforts. And 
we really need to get back involved with lobbying. Now, I, the church is becoming uninvolved in politics. The church used to be the place where public discourse took place, but we become scared of being involved in, pub, in public policy and lobbying efforts. We're not prevented from lobbying. We're restricted. The 501c3 restricts religious affiliations and nonprofit groups from being involved in lobbying activities. But uh, court rulings have established that to probably be something close to 10 to 15 percent. A 501c3 could, could be involved up to 10 to 15 percent of their overall efforts could be involved in lobbying to affect legislature. But we're silent upon the issue. A group such as the National Right to Life, Americans United for Life, the National Pro Life Alliance are some of the groups that are involved with enacting the, po the policies, the restrictions that have been enacted over the last, last few years. I think we need to get, invo get involved on some level. Find these groups, consider regular monthly donations, get on their email list so you know when the petitions are coming out. We have to reawaken to this horror. Remember after World War II, everyone was so critical of the German people for letting that happen, you know? It wasn't just the Nazis but they accused the entirety of the German population as being complicit in, the, in what was taking place there in the Holocaust. But I guarantee you, a lot fewer, a much lower percentage of the population there knew what was really happening to the Jews than know what's happening to babies here. Everyone here knows what's happening. We need to reawaken to this. There is some good news. Uh, the numbers have fallen off. They're the, the lowest in, 2000, in 2011, they had reached the lowest level since 1973 when Roe versus Wade was passed. Roe versus Wade, dramatic increase, reached up to about 5,000 babies per day, and it's now fallen off, now back down to about 3,000 babies per day. But we have to do something. We need to stand up, get involved, and start protecting what is the most innocent of people in our society, the most innocent. Remember, God created us in his image. You could argue what that mean, meant, but it clearly was not biological anatomy, bilateral symmetry and, and uh, you know, having five fingers and five toes. And clearly it was not that. The image of God, we are creating God's image. We are spiritual beings created with the capacity for love, for love. And that is the most important law. Jesus, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important law? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbors yourself. Love. The outflowing of love is what the church has gotten away from. We're too involved with judging other people for their sins. We're not called to judge people outside of the church for their sins. Only God can judge whether something is a sin to that person. A sin by definition is something a person knows is wrong, but does it anyway. And only God can judge whether that person knows that what they are doing is wrong. We cannot, we're not called to judge people for their sins outside of the church. All, the only attitude they should be getting from us is one of love. One of love. But there are certain things we know are wrong, that everyone knows are wrong. A person may not know that their homosexual activity is wrong. But everyone knows when they harm someone else, that's wrong. We have a built-in sense of right and wrong that gives us that insight. Some sins are only defined by the Bible. Harming someone else, we know from our built-in sense of right and wrong. It, we know that killing someone else is wrong. We know that bashing them over, we, stealing from them is wrong. And everyone knows that killing a baby is wrong. Unless they've been convinced by some abortion industry that it's not a baby. All it is is a little mass of tissue. Education helps. Pointing out where, these, where this baby really is in developmental stages helps. But I'd argue that at the moment of conception, you saw how, how quickly that thing, it changed in the zebrafish. 21 hours. Can we really ourselves say when that is a baby and when it isn't? The moment of conception, everything changes. And everything changes rapidly. We need to, we need to re reawaken to that. But what, what we were given by God was an extraordinary thing. The human body is like nothing else. But uh, remember, this is just a show. We're like a marionette operating a little puppet here. But we are really a spiritual being, one with a great capacity for love. And we need to allow that love to begin to flow out of us like we were called to do. Let the Spirit of God fill us and let the love of God flow out to us, to everyone around us. Unfortunately, I think we have...
too, we too quickly adopt a position of uh, self-reliance. You know, the American, sense of a, the American sense of capitalism and looking out for number one. And I think the church has lost uh, the outflowing of love, the charitable giving that we're supposed to have. And I think uh, the fact that we've moved away from such critical issues as abortion kind of speaks to that. We need to reawaken. But it's an incredible thing that God has made for us. We have to serve a wonderful God. We think about what, he, what it is that he has made this wonderful ecosystem he put together, all the various animals and plants that we love, and this, this body that he made us. That is the pinnacle of the creation itself, this biological form. But we are itself a spiritual being. 